Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and tonight we're speaking with Greg Bear, author most recently of the science fiction thriller Hole Zero Three. We sat down at Third Place Books in Lake Forest Park and discussed science, science fiction, and the importance of a writer staying young. Enjoy. Well, uh, I like monsters. Monsters got me started. Uh, I like uh, imaginative stories. I like all sorts, all aspects of imaginative literature. Fairy tales to myth to uh, horror stories to ghost stories. Uh, I loved watching science fiction movies and reading comics and everything. And I started writing stories about the age of seven or eight. Manila folders, the usual thing. And, uh, you know, they often had giant robots in them and that sort of stuff. So I was, I was all set to go. By the time I was nine, I was firmly committed. But science fiction is the thing where I believe you have a chance to really change the world, to introduce ideas to people. If you write a ghost story, they'll, they'll be excited by it, they'll love it, might be literature, but you aren't going to really suggest that society should change. Most of my major science fiction books have something in them that says this can't go on, or this shouldn't go on, or here's another opportunity, another possibility. A lot of them actually write science fiction. Everyone from Freeman Dyson to Fred Hoyle, you know, to, to Gregory Benford and, and uh, all these working scientists doing science fiction because they love the ideas. It's where, it's where science goes to dream. But quite often, scientists come up with the ideas first and then they're expressed well in science fiction and spread out to the public. And that's kind of an interesting back and forth. So science and science fiction actually have a relationship of exchanging ideas. Uh, the scientists do the hard work, there's no doubt about it. But if they want their ideas to go broadcast, science fiction is a good way to go, and a science fiction movie is where it really goes big. So that's the, that's the, the brass ring for a scientific idea. I learned that I can deceive myself as to how complicated I'm being. When I wrote City at the End of Time, a big, big book, a lot of effort, I thought it was going to be remarkably simple for people to understand. It didn't turn out that way. When I was writing Hall 03, I thought, oh, this is too complicated. Nobody's going to get this. Everybody gets it. It's got a response across the board, which is very gratifying and a little puzzling, because I just have no idea, you know, when something's going to strike and when it's not. And I think it has to do with familiarity. There are ideas that are familiar to people because they've seen it often enough, some version of it. This is what allows mysteries to be so exciting. You don't have to work too hard to get into the milieu. The world is there, you know the detective, you know they're fraught with angst, you know all of this, and you know, you know the law. Science fiction is now kind of reaching that stage. But you can't do it in a standard form and not create new material. I'm happy to borrow ideas from my favorite writers, but they have to be done in a different way or with something new added. And Hull Zero Three, I think, succeeds at that. It happens to me every three years or so. Uh, if I take a look at Eon, there was a period when I was writing that book when I stopped dreaming. I had 60 speaking characters, you know, 500 pages in paperback. Uh, all of this stuff going on and, and a lot of what would later become very familiar to people in terms of computer, virtual reality, you know, space warps and so on, which I was helping put together. Uh, artificial worlds. So, you know, the brain got stretched. Uh, and thereafter, writing a book like Queen of Angels was also a stretch because I was using different language. I was creating a syntax for the future, which still had to be accessible to people today. And yet these books were translated all over the world. You know, uh, Darwin's Radio, Biology, I realized back in the early 90s that I think I understood how evolution worked, sort of. And it wasn't what a lot of our standard evolutionary theories were telling us. We don't understand what a species is. We don't understand what evolution is. We've just found two new kinds of human species which coexisted with us at different stages. One of them three feet tall, like a hobbit. <laughs> Homo erectus, three feet tall, 17,000 years old. I mean, in, in Darwin's children, I had them find Homo erectus remains 20,000 years old. But they weren't three feet tall. That would have been ridiculous. So I'm halfway there. But sometimes life just gets totally, shockingly, um, Surprising. If you want to publish and make a career out of it, that's a whole different level of commitment. It's a level in which your family might suffer, your personal life might suffer, your mentality might suffer, uh, because you're going to constantly get rejected, and often for no good reason. You're going to be rejected by people who aren't fit to reject your shoe heel, and, that's, and it's still going to be you know, professionally devastating. 
So you have to go through all of that. You have to be tough, but you've got to maintain a childlike sense of wonder and discovery and realize that you're not in charge. Your conscious mind is not the one doing all this. Don't browbeat yourself and don't browbeat what Philip Jose Farmer called the black gang in your brain, the ones shoveling the coal of ideas 24 hours a day. Don't tell them they're full of it because they might start shoveling coal. And you can't get um, too committed to a particular philosophy or even a particular personality. Uh, you can't get solidified. You should always be young.